Someone recently asked me, Zero, what's your favorite episode of Code Geass? I was stunned by my own inability to produce an answer. I've seen this show over 20 times now. I've practically memorized the episode list. To rectify this absolute crime, I decided a multiple part Code Geass video series was obviously the most efficient way to come up with an answer. I'm Zero, this is Kado, and today, let's determine the best episode of Code Geass R1. But first, a message from our sponsors. Today's video is brought to you by Ryan Tang's Strength of a Thousand. If you like my Code Geass content, you're probably a fan of fictional political intrigue and fantastical settings, strategy, and giant robots. You probably like cohesive narratives with competent writing, and artwork with depth to it. If these assumptions are correct, then Strength of a Thousand is the novel for you. We've wanted for a while to set a good first impression with our first ever sponsor on the channel, so we're glad for the opportunity to signal boost a fellow creative. Ryan Tang is a longtime fan of the mecha anime genre, and he believes his book will appeal even to those who don't read much science fiction. He was gracious enough to grant us early access to his first book to read it for the sponsorship, and I definitely think the project will appeal to Western Code Geass fans. Like Code Geass, this is a story that doesn't feel the need to hold the reader's hand. It doesn't spoon-feed you boring expository information every time something happens or is said that you don't readily understand. It's got intrigue. It has subtle anime influences in its ensemble and its premise about fighting demons with giant robots. Humanity is trapped on colonies in space, and a main character, like Lelouch, is a deposed prince who lives in exile and secrecy. If any of this sounds appealing or you just want to reward our discretion in picking our sponsors, go ahead and buy these books. You can get a digital copy for just $2.99, a paperback for $14.99, or get it absolutely free if you're a Kindle Unlimited user. But you don't need a Kindle to buy the book. The Kindle app is available to download for free on your phone. If you buy book one and sign up for List Host, you can get the prequel book for free too. Links to everything will be in the description. Thank you Strength of a Thousand for sponsoring this video. There's one episode that stood out to me more than usual on this most recent rewatch. In my youth, I regarded the moments at Ashford Academy as unnecessary distractions from the cool robot fights. This time around, I was much more invested in tracking each character's journey throughout the show. And I have to say, episode 21 delivers on some truly intriguing intersections of these characters' paths, as well as possibly the funniest joke in the show. I love the tragic music that plays as Suzaku drops a giant pizza dough on a nearby tree, and C2's heartbroken reaction to seeing her dreams dashed. But we get ahead of ourselves. The main conceit of the episode is that Ashford Academy is hosting a huge festival that pretty much everyone shows up for, which is a setup that lends itself to jeopardizing every character's secrets. Understandably, this leads to more than one emotional crisis for Lelouch, who's practically living a quadruple life at this point. Ogi is the first to narrowly avoid the hot water as he's discovered masquerading as a normal Eleven on a date with a Britannian woman that he happened to kidnap because he was getting suspicious of Zero's intentions. But Colin also has to avoid her allegiance to the Black Knights being discovered when her soldier friend Suzaku shows up while she's trying to hide Ogi. And he has happens to bring Shirley, who's been dying to talk to Lelouch about the note she found, referring to him as Zero. Add all of that to the fact that Lelouch is also hiding in the supply closet with C2, whom almost everyone in the room will recognize as being associated with Zero, and the fact that there are five people immune to his Gios present, and you have a situation stressful enough to give Lelouch a heart attack. Suzaku is basically one epiphany away from piecing together that Lelouch is Zero at this point, and he's told C2 at least a hundred times not to be seen around the campus. Lelouch is having a crisis. This moment really is the best example of the threat of Lelouch's lives crashing into to one another, as he tries to keep apart people who know him as Lelouch Lamperouge, Lelouch Britannia, and Zero with only the assistance of a dimly lit room. And this is only the first sphincter clenching moment for the day, as he discovers when Nunnally, the princess he's trying to keep hidden from the Empire, shows up with a poorly disguised Princess Euphemia. This leads to another hilarious moment where he's trying to talk to her privately and gets caught by Shirley again, who thinks he's flirting with some girl while she's been trying to talk to him about something important for days only to be met with constant dismissal. Then Euphemia inevitably gets spotted and he has to make a mad dash with his wheelchair-bound sister while every camera on the school grounds centers on the pink at princess. And this ends up turning into a live nationwide broadcast, so Schneisel probably knew Zero was Lelouch from this early on if you ask me. Despite being a relatively light episode as far as plot relevance goes, it all culminates in one of the most substantial reveals in the series, the introduction of the specially administrated zone of Japan. Pretty much everyone hates it, with the exception of Schneisel who's thinking ahead to how it'll disrupt the Black Knights. Aside from the big moments, there's so much going on in this episode. From the Jeremiah cameo, to Nina trying to stand up for Euphemia and nearly getting trampled, to Sayako joining the Black Knights, to Lelouch's scornful sneer after Nunnally laments that Suzaku and Euphemia have seemingly gotten romantically involved. If you're into Code Geass doing the slice of life thing, this episode might end up high on your personal list because of the sheer density of charm on display. But if you ask me, while it was an amazing episode, there could have been more giant robots hitting each other with swords. Episode 13 had a fair amount of giant robots hitting each other with swords. Lelouch is on his peak anime villain bullshit with this episode, with some of his most distinctly shady behavior yet. He's 
deceived the Black Knights, of course, but this is the first time he outright lies to them about their operational goals. After his resolve was shaken by the realization that the girl he loved lost her father as a result of his action, he steals himself against his doubt and regret. If he's going to bear the weight of guilt, he may as well make good use of it. Even if he must become an enemy of his Britannian friends and use the Black Knights like pawns, it will be worth it if he meets his goals. His conviction is newly invigorated, and the next victim for him to exploit will be General Katase of the Japanese Liberation Front. Thanks to information Detar secured, Zero is able to intercept a plan to squash the head of the JLF. As Cornelia pursues retribution for the hotel jacking performed by Lieutenant Colonel Kusakabe, Zero blows Katase up to scramble Cornelia's forces. It's a cunning, cowardly plan that only a demon could bring to fruition. The result? Lelouch really has Cornelia on the ropes this time. But Lelouch isn't the only one who's been called to action by the death of Shirley's father. Suzaku was more invested in stopping Zero than ever before, because Zero is just like his father, Genbu Kudorugi. As a child, Suzaku, being the kind boy that he is, sees how the war against Britannia is hurting the Japanese people. In the face of this suffering, he doesn't understand the lofty ideals that Genbu Kudorugi holds in worthy esteem to keep fighting. He sees it as a pointless struggle. They can't win against the Britannians no matter how hard they fight. It's just causing more bloodshed. If they just accepted their fate, they wouldn't have to suffer so much. The subjugation of Elevens is a better fate than their entire nation potentially being wiped out. But his father wouldn't listen. He wouldn't see his proud Japan abandon their pride. So Suzaku, the kind boy that he is, killed his father to spare his people suffering. And years later, he believes he wasn't wrong. Japanese people can choose a peaceful life under Britannian rule. Dragging out the chaos just causes more suffering, but he hates himself for the contemptible means he used to achieve that end. Zero's rebellion is plunging the country into that same war once again. He treats the collateral damage as necessary sacrifice. And again, Suzaku believes his only option to limit the pain of his people is to take up the blade and end the pointless rebellion himself. It's because of Zero's fruitless ambition that Shirley's father had to die. And from Lelouch's perspective, it's because of the Lancelot that'll have to stain his hands with even more sin to kill Cornelia. This episode has a lot going for it. Johann Liebert never questions the path he's on. We never get to see Light Yagami come to terms with the fact that he's murdered thousands of people as easily as writing down a name. Despite his atrocities, the conviction on display as Lelouch laments what he's done and decides to walk forward nonetheless makes him all the more sympathetic. And as someone who ships Lelouch in C2, the way she helps him process it by getting a rise out of him while encouraging him to stay on his chosen path is touching, though she probably could have been nicer about it. This episode encompasses many of the themes the show has to offer very well. It's got angst, it's got action, it's got the first appearance of Mao, it even has some bonding between my OTP. It's hard to say what this episode is lacking, but I don't feel confident giving it the number one spot either. Maybe if it had a Jibun Wo. Being invested in the individual journeys of each side character has really helped me to appreciate Shirley a lot more. There's this segment in episode 7 where she interrogates Colin about her relationship with Lelouch because that's somehow less nerve-wracking than just talking to the man, and I really appreciate how it's handled. It's made clear that Colin won't be able to clear up the misunderstanding with a few short lines of dialogue. Rather than show her get upset over said misunderstanding and getting consoled by Suzaku, the entire thing is communicated by brief scenes of her confronting Colin, Colin storming off with Shirley tearing up, her breaking down in front of Suzaku, and the final transition to her absentmindedly talking about Lelouch while having calmed down. The result is that we manage to get this narrative beat about Shirley's emotions without feeling that our mecha anime war scenes are being held hostage by angsty high school drama. Shirley's arc has really moved me this time around. The way her father's death motivates Lelouch and Suzaku is interesting enough, but the way it motivates Shirley herself is intriguing as well. She idolizes her father, and after losing him, she tries to fill the void with Lelouch. The threat of him getting stolen away by Colin has been weighing on her, so she tries to confirm how he really feels. When she learns that Lelouch may have been involved with the Black Knights, she cooperates with Valletta's investigation to find the truth. She needs to know if the man she loves played a hand in her father's death. But the truth is worse than she feared, and in the process of finding out, she dirties her own hands with blood. Which brings us to episode 14 of R1. Being an ordinary girl dragged into Lelouch's world of secrecy and violence, Shirley becomes emotionally unstable as she tries to deal with all of it. And this instability makes her a prime target for Mao's manipulation. She's so confused and guilty that convincing her that she and Lelouch does deserve to die together was easy. Shirley represents the life of Lelouch Lamperouge, which he has chosen to throw away in favor of the Path of Zero. If he hadn't chosen vengeance, Lelouch would have lived a normal life under the Empire, finding a job, marrying a girl from school, and living out the rest of his days by Nunnally's side. That is to say, if he hadn't been burdened by his tragic past, he could have loved Shirley. Shirley, I'm sorry about your father. If I could be reborn into a new life, I want.
This is what always made her an interesting candidate for Lelouch's love interest, and Lelouch destroying that potential by using his Gios on her foreshadows what will ultimately become of Lelouch Lamperouge if he continues down this path. Foreshadowing may as well be the name of the episode, as we witness a final encounter with Mal being set up, along with the continued teasing of whatever it is Kasitu's contract was all about, and we're made to wonder what the result of Ogi finding Valletta will be. This might be the best Mal episode, though I'd honestly give it to episode 15 for reasons discussed in my importance of Mal video. The way he approaches getting rid of Lelouch is delightful delightfully sadistic and barely planned, befitting of the spontaneous nature of Mao's psychosis. It also features a chess game, which I did analyze, but there wasn't much symbolism there aside from the fact that Lelouch was getting his ass beaten. This episode continues the theme of Lelouch having to bear the weight of his own atrocities pretty beautifully. The dominoes continue to fall, and Lelouch's life is beginning to unravel. All of this personal drama with Shirley started with a pair of episodes that can't go unmentioned when you're talking about the best moments in Code Geass, the Battle of Narita, which claimed the life of Shirley's father. There are more than a few iconic moments in this battle, such as the debut of Gurren Mark II's powerful Radiant Wave Surger, as well as the first instance of Lelouch's scientific mind informing his strategies, and his favorite calculated explosion combat tactic. After suffering a humiliating loss against Cornelia's military organization, Lelouch has been building a group that will follow him with the same level of faith by promoting the Black Knights as Knights for Justice, garnering public affection and new support for their movement in the form of new recruits and acknowledgement from the Six Houses of Kyoto. Using these tools and a tip from Detar, he ambushes Cornelia's forces. New members of the Black Knights had been regarding it as a fun vigilante club, but Zero used this opportunity to establish his sole leadership and their role as an organization that will wage war against Britannia. This episode showcases Cornelia's military dominance, and gives the impression that if not for Zero, she would have extinguished Eleven Rebellion in a matter of months. The battle itself is one of my favorites of the show. It's fun to watch Lelouch work, and now he has Colin to counter the Lancelot. Jeremiah and Valletta are present, trying to restore their tarnished names, only for Orange Boy to get Mike away for their ambitions. Even Inoue takes up a leadership role. Despite Lelouch's opening tactic tipping the scales, the battle is still quite close. Zero even starts to sweat a little before Toto and the Four Holy Swords appear. Toto is able to anticipate and cooperate with Zero's plan without them even being in communication. They were nearly able to checkmate Cornelia, until the Lancelot appeared and turned the game into a stalemate. He got quite close to capturing Zero, but C2 was able to prevent that, suffering severe wounds in the process. This mini-arc also offers some tender moments between the LTP, including the moment when Lelouch learns her true name while tending to her wounds. Earlier, C2 reveals that she's lost her memories and asks Lelouch about the name she's chosen. She says that the name Lelouch is a sign of his sentimentality. He accuses her name of going too far in the opposite direction touching on a sore spot for C2. Having no memory of her life, she's lost the ability to be sentimental. She feels disconnected from her own identity, and thus chooses a new name, one disconnected from humanity. In response, C2 states that Snow is white because it's forgotten what color it's supposed to be, a clear parallel to her identity. She doesn't remember who she was, so she is C2. Lelouch later responds that he doesn't know why Snow is white, but he still finds Snow beautiful, indirectly stating that even though he doesn't know why she's C2 because he doesn't know her history, she's still worthy of acceptance as she is. I've been watching Code Geass since I was 9 years old. Moments like this were the reason I make analysis videos. They were the origin of my analytical nature. It wouldn't be inaccurate to say that this show taught me to analyze media, particularly characters. I used to ask myself, why did this character say these words in this context? My most unique insights often come from interpreting a single vague sentence that a character makes and figuring out what that means in terms of their larger arc. And a large part of what I respect so much about this show is that it has a surplus of moments like this. This is a fairly simple example but it's one that has stuck with me over the years and initially made me realize that I love stories that make me think. Thanks to Code Geass, I realized the way I privately interact with a show or a manga or a comic book or a video game can be as enjoyable as the content itself. If I could combine episodes 10 and 11, it'd come pretty close to the quintessential Code Geass episode, but it's two episodes, so my search continues. Well, now that I'm 3,000 words in, I suppose I can drop the Koi act and tell you what I'm actually prepared to dub the best episode of R1. The final selection certainly surprised me. The episode stood out early into the rewatch, and I was sure something was going to usurp its throne eventually, but made it all the way to the end of R1 without anything else scratching the precise itch that this so perfectly nails. Episode 7 features the first battle between Cornelia and Zero. Cornelia's first priority as Viceroy up to this point has been to enact revenge against Zero, who has besmirched Britannia and killed her brother. She quickly comes up with a plan 
plan to bait and trap this fledgling terrorist. Sensing Zero's flair for drama, she sets a stage for him to make a miracle happen. She predicts based on what happened to Clovis that Zero's ultimate goal will be to kill her by drawing out her personal guard or drawing her out into the battlefield. As in Shinjuku, he does this by creating chaos, giving terrorists the camouflage of friendly IFF signals. And once Zero begins to rally the rebels and turn the tide of battle, she orders her forces to retreat, knowing Zero wouldn't pass up the opportunity to get close to her. There's no need to predict Zero's ingenious tactics to try to outplay him in the fog of war. She knows that he'll come right to her, and uses that fact to create a scenario where he's completely trapped among enemy forces. Once that's achieved, she begins tidying up the stragglers who are still following Zero's order. In episode 2, after Colin saves Zero from the Lancelot due to feeling indebted to him for turning an impossible situation around, Lelouch remarks that the most important element in battle is the human one. But in episode 7, he neglects his human element and simply orders the terrorists under his command like chess pieces. This leads to revolts across the board, as the entire band of rebels ultimately abandons his leadership. Lelouch is stranded, without backup, deep inside the enemy camp, and he only survives because C2 bails him out. Episode 7 is Cornelia's complete victory, and it solidifies her as a worthier opponent of Zero than Clovis. And it's this defeat which gives Lelouch the idea to form the Black Knights in the United States of Japan. Despite the fact that we're all here to watch Lelouch pull off badass schemes, it would be less exciting if we were guaranteed of his victory every time. Quite the contrary, Lelouch suffers more than a few close calls throughout the series, which makes his moments of triumph feel all the more triumphant. Episode 7 also has the first reference to Nina developing the Flea, the first instance of C2's mysterious conversation which is a source of intrigue throughout the series, up until the later half of R2. And it also has the Shirley moments in Ashford Academy that I've already touched on a bit. All in all, this episode is the one I find myself coming back to most often when I'm in the mood for a single episode of Code Geass. The fact that I've watched it more than the rest of the series is probably enough to qualify it as my favorite episode, but I'm glad I took the time to examine why it fills the role of the Code Geass snack so well. Most of the series is so woven into itself that watching only an episode or two can feel odd, but episode 7 manages to find the balance of fitting well into the larger plot while still being enjoyably self-contained. Before you all sarcastically thank me for my contributions to science, I'd like to point out that this wasn't an entirely pointless exercise. It was mostly an excuse to rewatch Code Geass again and talk about some of my favorite moments, but that serves the purpose that basically all of my content does, providing a voice for my voiceless, like-minded peers. We may have our differences, but anyone still watching the video to this point must be someone who loves the show as much as I do. As I say that though, I really don't understand how anyone could not love this show. Hoodie recently told me that given the way I talk about this show, he thought Code Geass was an undisputed all-time anime great, akin to Neon Genesis Evangelion or Fullmetal Alchemist Brotherhood, and he was surprised to find out that not everyone in the anime community shares that opinion. This isn't news to me. I see people underrating this brilliant series all the time, but the more I try to approach it with a critical eye, the more it baffles me. All you really have to do is watch it with your brain not turned off, and you'll realize that this is a show crafted with impressive intent. It it begins with a plan and nails its themes, foreshadowing, character motivations, dramatic beats, and most especially, nuanced, meaningful dialogue pretty much throughout the entire ride. And it does it all without wasting any of the viewer's time on anything that doesn't need to be explained. Honestly, the fact that this is the format I chose is probably an indication of my training in analytic philosophy. This format of analyzing individual episodes probably isn't even the best way to make the point of how phenomenal this show is, when so many of the moments are motivated by events from several episodes prior and informed by events many episodes episodes later. It's all such an intricate tapestry. The writing in this show is generally a match for the likes of Naoki Orasawa, Hiromu Arakawa, Sugumi Oba, or Shinobu Kaitani, aka the Genius Mangaka Club. The fact that it isn't widely regarded as a masterpiece is baffling, and I'm done putting up with it. So listeners, one and all, I beseech you, spread the gospel of Code Geass, scream it from the rooftops, let there be no question of this show's status as a masterpiece. Of course, there are great episodes I considered for this list but didn't discuss in this video, such as the first two episodes which I spoke about at length in my Man Behind the Mask video, as well as the aforementioned episode 15, which I talk about in my Mao video, and Bloodstained Yuffie, which Replay Value recently put out a great video discussing. I mostly wanted to talk about moments that I haven't seen approached on YouTube to my knowledge. Thanks again to Strength of a Thousand for sponsoring this video. Be sure to check out the book with the link in the description. Thanks as well to all of our lovely patrons over at patreon.com slash kadoyt. If you like this video for some reason, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.